I'm going to invite you to have a seat and to grab your Bibles or your Bible app and uh, turn to the book of Exodus. Chapter 20 is where we're going to be today. Exodus chapter 20. If uh, you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you and turn to page 72 and you will find Exodus chapter 20. Yes, it's page 72. It's way back toward the front of the book. And, uh, and you can find it. So even if you don't have a Bible like mine, you can uh, still find it. It's the second book in the Bible, Exodus 20. And by the way, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please take one of those that you find in the seats around you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. And after all, that's why we exist. So uh, uh, anybody have a kind of busy life? Anybody busy in life? You know, there's not very many hands being raised. Did you guys not did you have all your stuff ready yet? Let's try it again. Anybody, anybody busy? Oh, okay. Now the hands are going up. I, I had to do that last service too. I was like, are you guys just too tired to raise your hands? Is that it? You're so busy. You're like, oh, I'm here. I got, I got here. But yeah. yeah. You see, the thing is, we're so busy. We live life at warp speed, right? We've got jobs to do. We've got kids to take care of. We've got school, homework, sporting events, practices, doctor's appointments, business deals, family events. Got to show up for the birthdays and all that stuff. Social engagements. We've got ministry activities, life group, friends to see, trips to take. And not only that, not only are we busy with our schedules, but we are connected 24-7. We've got phones. We've got tablets. We've got computers. Now we've got watches, Right? And we got uh, email, we got text, we got Instagram, we got Facebook. I, I mean, we can't get away from people. We are so busy. We just never stop. And into our crazy, busy lives, God has the audacity to speak, challenging our very way of life. Psalm 4610, God says, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. <laughs> Be still. Every mother of preschoolers in this room dreams of it. <laughs> Every parent with kids in soccer, baseball, dance, gymnastics, swimming, uh, etc., has given up on the idea. Every adult with a job you know, longs for days without deadlines and Fridays without quotas. Uh, even retirees wonder, how did I ever work? Right? Because I've heard that so many times. I don't know how I had time to do for a job with grandkids and medical appointments and friends and all of that. And yet God says, be still. Be still and know that I'm God. Be still without the assistance of an adult beverage or prescription meds. He just challenges us to be still, to slow down so that we can know him and love him. So that we can know ourselves and love ourselves. Because, you know, the two great commands are to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves. You see, that's why from the very beginning, from creation, God gave us the gift of Sabbath. God gave us the gift of Sabbath. Exodus chapter 20, if you're not familiar with this, this is the, the time when God gave the Ten Commandments. So if, uh, if you're familiar with the, the concept of the Ten Commandments, this is the chapter they're found in. I'd encourage you to go home and read them again. Uh, great stuff. But we're going to look at the fourth commandment. The fourth commandment begins in, in verse 8 of Exodus 20. It says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. From the very beginning of time, God wove Sabbath into our lives in order to bless us. 
so that we wouldn't work all the time, so, uh, you know, be constantly busy, be overscheduled, overcommitted, and overwhelmed by life. Now, in the beginning, God gave that command to a nation, a people who were all living together, living kind of by the same standards, same guidelines. And, and uh, he said, well, I want you to be different from the nations around you. And there's going to be a day where you all stop working and you all pause to remember me that I've set you free from slavery, that I've called you my people, that I've revealed myself to you, and you're going to worship me and, and celebrate the life that I've given you. It's to honor God. It's a, it's a day that you're going to just all stop and do that. But in other words, God gave us Sabbath so we could be still and slow down and pause and reflect and refresh and enjoy. Of course, uh, over time, people messed up God's gift. Uh, I mean, that's what we do, right? So by the time Jesus walked this earth... Uh, the, the religious people of Israel had, had turned the Sabbath from a day of rest into a day that imprisoned people by the rules. They had 642 rules for Sabbath. 642 things that explained what you could and couldn't do on Sabbath. And they couldn't do anything. And, and, um, and in fact, uh, ultra-Orthodox Jews today still follow many of those rules. So we were in Israel recently, and, and uh, on the Sabbath, uh, the, a, a lot of the Orthodox Jews will come to hotels because they can't cook and they can't do anything, so they got people doing it for them. I don't know what happened to that sojourners in your land thing. But, uh, but anyway, they, uh, here, here's the thing. They have Sabbath elevators, Sabbath elevators, because apparently this is work. And so you can't push a button to go to the floor that you want on the Sabbath. So you know what a Sabbath elevator is? It's my concept of hell. It's an elevator that stops on every floor. Okay, so if you had a patience problem like I do, it's not the elevator you ever want to get on. But they still have all these rules in place, and then they kind of make explanations that allow them to break the rules without breaking the rules. As an outsider looking in, it's amazing, but it's also imprisoning. And into that world, Jesus challenged their understanding, their man-made rules about Sabbath. And he broke them. He broke their man-made rules. He's the Son of God. He's the Savior of the world. He's God in the flesh. And he broke their rules about Sabbath. You know what he did? He had the audacity to heal people on the Sabbath. And the religious people didn't like that because they said healing is work. So you don't want to heal people on the Sabbath. And you know what they actually said in one case? They said there's six other days they can come and get healed. And you know what Jesus did? Healed them anyway. Healed them anyway. And then he said this. He said man wasn't made for the Sabbath. Sabbath was made for man. In other words, God gave us Sabbath as a gift. And when we talk about Sabbath now, we're not talking about a set 24-hour time period by which we, we all have to stop at the same time and do stuff at the same time. No, what we're talking about is this idea where we disconnect from our normal life and we connect to God where we slow down, where we change the pace, where we reflect and renew our heart and soul and our mind so that we can be the people that God has called us to be. God gifted us with Sabbath because we need the Sabbath. Let's talk about the need for Sabbath. We need to slow down. We need to be still. We're just not very good at it, are we? So God gave us a day. He gave us a time period, a day to be different, to be holy, to be set apart for that which is truly important. So we need Sabbath for rest. For rest. Anybody tired today? Oh, look, hands are already going up. It's, it's not even noon yet, and we're already tired. We get up tired. You know what that means? That means you need Sabbath. You need rest. Here, here's the truth. Our bodies are weak, and they're continuing to fail. See, there's this thing called sin. Uh, all of us have done it. Uh, we all rebelled against God's plan. We've all been selfish and, and all that kind of stuff. And so because of sin, death entered into the world. And, and therefore, because of our rebellion, we're all suffering the effects of sin, which means we're all dying, which means our bodies are getting older. Have you noticed? You know, you're not still one of those people that's in denial about, I can do everything I could 20 years ago. Yeah, you can. It just hurts a lot longer and takes you 10 times as long to recover. Okay. 
So go ahead and live in a... You know, our bodies are older, they're getting weaker, and, and we need the rest. And God's plan is, hey, I built this thing called Sabbath into your life to bless you so that you can get the rest so that you can do all the things that God has for us to do. You know, God has a to-do list for you. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, you have a to-do list because Scripture says you are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for you to do. So all of the important stuff, all the life-changing stuff, all of the the, the things that are going to make a difference in this world that God has for you to do, you need to rest so you can do them. You need to pause and refresh and renew so you can accomplish the things that God has for you to do. And and see, here's the myth. Here's the myth that drives our lives. I can't rest because I have too much to do. Right? There's no time to rest. i got to get these things done. They're important to me, and I've got to get these finished so I don't have time to rest. And, And God counterintuitively says, no, if you want to accomplish all the things that are truly important, Rest. Rest. Uh, personally, this speaks into my life because about 10, 12 years ago as, as uh, pastoring Calvary and seeing God grow it and, and bless it in so many ways, I actually had one of those conversations with God and myself, which was how long can I keep up this pace? And you know what God told me? You can't. Step back, let go, trust me. Don't try and do it all. Do the things that are important. Because his plan and mine is to be the long-term leader at Calvary. And God is not honored by burnout. And God does not delight in workaholics. You know what God's honored by? God is honored when we take Sabbath. God is honored when we trust him enough to admit our weakness, both physically and mentally and spiritually, And say, God, I need to step back. I need to rest so that you can renew me and refresh me so that I can be the person you want me to be. Hey, when you're tired, are you very patient? Eh, Not really, huh? When you're exhausted and worn out and frazzled and stressed, do you tend to be more kind or less kind to the people around you? And yet, if our calling is to love our neighbor as ourself, Love is patient, and love is kind. How are we going to represent Christ to the world if we're impatient and unkind? That alone is cause for us to rest. And God gave us Sabbath because we need a rest. We also need Sabbath for relationships. Relationships. Uh, Sabbath is for relationships. First of all, it's for our relationship with God. It's a time for us to detach from life and focus on worship and celebrating grace and life. And, and, and just pausing to give thanks to God and connect with God because it's a relationship. You know, here at Calvary, we put it this way. We exist to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. In other words, it is a relationship and no relationship is going to grow unless it's given time. And so Sabbath is a time for us to invest in the relationship we have with God so that we can get to know him better and love him more. But it's also a time to focus on other significant relationship. Sabbath is a time for spouses to talk, to communicate and connect. It's a time for families to engage and play and discuss. It's a time for friendships to be nurtured. And, And honestly, we really need Sabbath for relationships Because there's too many husbands and wives who are co-parenting, but not relating. They've become co-workers raising kids instead of loving, caring partners for a lifetime. And and not realizing that one day they're going to wake up and realize that without kids at home, we got nothing to talk about. There's too many parents who are doing lives as chauffeur and chef and maid instead of counselor and teacher and guide. 
And your kids are craving a relationship with you. And we're too busy just transporting them from point A to point B. There's too many people with surface friendships carrying unspoken pain because they think nobody has the time to listen to them or cares enough to do it. And we work really hard to keep up our appearances on social media while we're dying on the inside, sometimes from loneliness. By the way, this is why we encourage life groups. We all need to connect. You see, we really need Sabbath. We need to slow down, unplug, listen, share. But it's not easy. We know it's not easy. Last week, as we kicked off Freeway Series, I told you, this is not easy, and we all want it to be easy. Well, I don't know if you guys do. I do. I'm lazy, all right? I just want stuff to be easy. But it's not going to be easy, and if you want to be free like you've never been before, then that's going to take some effort. It's going to take some work, and and you're going to discover that the path to discovery is a slow walk and hard questions. If you really want to find freedom, then you're going to have to to kind of figure out that at some point you're going to have to slow down. And and see, this is really hard because most of us are in a hurry, right? I don't know about you guys, but uh, I'm always in a hurry, especially when I'm in the car. And and it's nothing personal. I'm not mad at other people or anything. I'm just in a hurry. The other day we were driving and and Meralda says, "Are, are you in a hurry? And I went, no, it's just how I drive. Just how, I want to get there. I want to get there fast. I want to get there now. And, and a lot of us do life that way. And so you show up in church, you say, God, I want you to fix me. I want you to fix me now. We want instant gratification. We want drive-through Christianity. But it's not going to happen in your life. If you're here and you really want to be free, you can't get there in a hurry. You need to slow down. And you need to connect with God. And you need to ask some questions that are going to be difficult to wrestle with. And and the model for this is Jesus. Three years is what Jesus had of ministry, recorded in the Gospels. Three years of investing in 12 men that would carry on his work and, and speaking to the crowds and healing people and all that. Three years. And you know what he did on a regular basis for three years? He pulled away from the crowds, he left his disciples behind, and he went and prayed. He spent time with the Father. Yeah, that, was that because Jesus was weak and, and needy and, you know, not really cut out for the whole Messiah gig? No. It's because Jesus was demonstrating for us what a healthy, balanced life looks like. That no matter how great the task, no matter how momentous the occasion, there is always time and priority to connect with God. To spend time with the Father, to seek His counsel, His encouragement, His affirmation, His strength, His peace. So if you really want to walk that path to freedom, slow down and make time with God a priority. And be willing to consider some hard questions in His presence. Questions that allow God to reveal the pain that is, you know, holding us back, that that we've been hiding or avoiding or running from. Because freedom in your life is going to mean that you recognize the pain and the people and the events that that have left you damaged and you're trying to get past them or maybe you're not trying to get past them and you're just stuffing it and they're holding you captive. And God wants to set you free. So I'm going to, here's some questions. I'm I'm going to challenge you to have a conversation with God, not just once, but on an ongoing basis using these questions and questions like this. Uh, questions like, what am I trying to avoid? What am I trying to avoid? Because busyness is just a distraction from our pain sometimes. Are you trying to avoid conflict? Are you trying to avoid memories? Are you trying to avoid those open wounds in your soul? You see, we can live our lives so busy that we don't have time to deal with the pain inside of us, the pain that imprisons us. And so you know what that means? That means we're just busy prisoners. But we're still prisoners. And God wants to set you free so that you're not a prisoner and and so that you can live life with a purpose and with joy that he wants to give you. But that means that you have to get honest and go, okay, what are the things that I'm trying to avoid? And then second question, how am I struggling? How am I struggling? What are my recurring issues 
that keeps sabotaging my life? Uh, you know, what are the addictions, the habits, the patterns that are destructive in my life? Uh, if, if you can't answer that, then what are the messes you're always cleaning up? What, how, what are the, you know, uh, what does your emotions tell you about your emotional and spiritual and mental health? Do you have these uh, uncontrolled emotional outbursts, anger outbursts, that neither you nor the people around you that you've been, you know, vomiting your, your anger on uh, know where it came from? Do you have, you know, compulsions or, you know, do you compulsively shop or eat or drink or view pornography? And, and then when you get done, you repent and you're, and you're sorry that you did it uh, and, and you promise that you'll never do it again until the next time. And it seizes you and drives you into that and you think that maybe God has, you know, grown weary of forgiving you. In fact, sometimes you wonder if his grace is for you. And let me just tell you, God's grace abounds to you. His grace is enough for you. He, he doesn't get tired of forgiving us. But here's the truth. He wants to set you free. He wants to take you beyond that habit or addiction or compulsion that is holding you captive. So what are you struggling with? And then finally, how does God want to change me? I dare you to ask God that. God, how do you want to change me because Jesus is in the life-changing business as I said before Calvary exists to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ life-changing God has the power to change your life and he wants to change your life so I dare you to ask him God how do you want to change me because we are so tempted to always pray for God to change everybody else right we want God to change our spouse. We want God to change our kids. We want God to change our parents. We want God to change our boss so that we can be happy the way we are. Can I just tell you God's not going to answer those prayers? Not the way you want anyway. Because what he wants to do is change you. He wants to change your attitude, your heart, your behavior so that you can live as a child of God free indeed. And then you'll be amazed at how different everyone else is in your life. See, God wants to bless you by changing you. Changing you to be free. So be still. Be still and know that I am God. We want to. The idea is really appealing, but we don't know how. Honestly, we don't know how to do it. Uh, and, and again, this is the hard part. We have to alter our patterns. We've got to break the mold that we've been living in. We've got to get out of the rut of our life. We've got to make some choices to change some things. So I want to, I want to offer you some practical practices. I really hate that point after preaching it four times. Can I just say that? It just looks bad up there. Practical practices. I'm going to give you some tips, okay? Some, some things that you can put into practice that will not fix your life, but will help your life. They will not make you free, but they'll help you on that journey to freedom to get there. And, uh, and I'm going to offer four or five suggestions, depending on where you are in life, okay? And, uh, and here's the challenge. I'm going to challenge you to incorporate three of these into your life for the next six weeks. We have six more weeks of freeway. And, and I'm just going to challenge you to pick three of them and say, okay, I'm going to try these out in my life and see how they work. Because I believe if you try them out, you're going to see that God shows up and he's going to make a difference in your life. And, and you're going to go, hey, wow, this stuff actually works. I'm going to keep doing it. And God will keep leading you to freedom. So here we go. I got uh, four or five practical tips. Uh, things that, again, will help but not fix. First one is extended prayer. Extended prayer. Spend more time in prayer prayer with God. Do what Jesus did and pull away and, and spend some time talking to the Father. Now, uh, I realize as I share this, there's two groups of people in here, so let me talk to the two different groups. First group is this. You don't have a regular time in your life when you meet with God. I mean, you pray, you, you know, pray when things are tough, when you're in pain, uh, maybe at bedtime, maybe at mealtime, uh, maybe with the kids, but, but you don't have a set time to meet God. And, and I'm just going to encourage you to create a time, maybe it's once a week, maybe it's every day, doesn't matter to me, uh, but just a time when you say, okay, God, I'm going to meet you, 
and give you some time, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever it is. And, and, and in that time, here's what I'm going to challenge you to do. Uh, read the Bible or read a devotion, okay? We've got devotions available at the Connection Center. You can pick some up. On your YouVersion app, the Bible app that we encourage you to use, there's devotionals you can get every single day. Uh, there's devotions online you can go and get. Uh, just, just all kinds of resources. Uh, you could just read the Bible. I, that's what I recommend, but uh, I'm kind of a fan of it. Uh, heard it's a really good book. But, uh, but just, you know, grab one of the Bibles and, and read a chapter from the Gospels. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Or read a chapter of Proverbs. It's cra crazy practical. And, and just read that. It'll take you, you know, three or four minutes to read it. And then just kind of start thanking God for what he's doing in your life. And ask him to help you. That will be life-changing if you start doing that. Again, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to encourage you. Do it every day if you can. Do it at least three times a week. See how God changes your life. Now, some of you are sitting in this room, and you've been doing what I described for years. I mean, you grew up in church. They taught you how to have a quiet time, and you've been doing it. In fact, you've been doing it for so long, it is routine in your life. You get up every morning, get your coffee, you sit down with your devotion, you read it, you pray, you thank God for everything, check the box, and you're done. So if that's your life, then what I'm going to challenge you to do is make a date with God for an extended time of prayer. What's extended? I don't know, hour, half a day, all day. Go crazy. Make a date with God. Just say, okay, God, I'm going to have this time. So say it's an hour, it's at lunch. You don't have any other time because you're so busy. And you go, okay, I'm going to do lunch. I'm going to go to the park. I'm going to leave the phone in the car. I'm going to go sit on the bench in the sun. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to read my devotion. I'm going to take my journal. Maybe I'll write some prayers out. Uh, but you just take more time to listen to God and see what he has to say to you. Maybe you have an agenda. Maybe you don't. It doesn't matter because if you give God more time the relationship will grow and God will show up in your life in a new way. But you got to get practical. You actually have to do it. Can I, can I just tell you that extended times of prayer, what I call my dates with God, are a part of my regular weekly routine? It's part of my regular kind of quarterly routine. I'll actually go away for a couple of days to some other place, away from people, away from technology, so that I can just focus on God and what he has to say. And the more that I do that, the more that I crave that because God is real and he will show up and he will speak into your life, whether you give him 15 additional minutes or whether you give him a day. Uh, I dare you to try it. So extended prayer, it, it, it'll uh, help your life. Secondly, uh, go to Celebrate Recovery or get counseling. All right, see, you got some Celebrate Recovery fans right here. Uh, see, all of us need help and accountability. And every single one of us would benefit from the, the discipline of the 12-step program and Celebrate Recovery or talking to someone who's a counselor. And, and by the way, Celebrate Recovery meets Monday night, 6.30 at our McCulloch campus, and it is an incredible life-changing opportunity. And, and maybe you're sitting here going, yeah, you know, I'm just not messed up enough to need counseling or go to Celebrate Recovery. And I would argue, hey, thank you. Yeah, the truth is, yes, you are. Okay. <laughs> Truth is, all of us are. I've been through the 12 steps of Celebrate Recovery. It's great stuff because it forces you to look at your life and to see yourself and not be able to lie about it because there's other people there who will call you when you try to lie. It's awesome. It's wonderful. Counseling. You know, you say, I can't go to Celebrate Recovery. Fine, sit down with a counselor. You go, well, I don't have any burning issues. That's okay. Ask them to ask you the questions you don't want to answer. See, we're all comfortable answering the questions we're good with. But dare someone to ask you the questions you don't want to answer. Uh, invite them to do that. Maybe you've got a trusted friend that can do that for you. Uh, but uh, it's really healthy for all of us to discover those blind spots in our life and to work through them. Third thing, join a life group. Join a life group. Get past surface relationships and share life with other people. You know, because those people are going to ask you the hard questions and, and, and it's going to give people a chance to get to know you and love you and encourage you and pray for you. Uh, and, and it makes all the difference in the world. And, and here's the thing. If you miss the Life Group signups, come Thursday night here at 6.30. We, we've got spots for you. 
Okay, we want to help you and encourage you, and, and, and all of us need those relationships. Again, in my life, life group has been huge. Uh, my wife and I have been a part of a life group for six years, and it is life-changing and encouraging. It's where friendships are born, and, and there's accountability and help for life. All of us need those connections because life change happens in the context of relationships. Fourth and fifth suggestion, have a date night and a family unplug night. If you're married, have a date night. You need a date night. Couples, spend time together, not on your phones, not on your iPad, but spend time together talking. Because I know how it can be. You get the kids in bed, and you're exhausted, and you want to unwind, and so what do you do? Sit down at the computer, grab your phone, grab your iPad, and ignore each other until bedtime. You're empty nesters, and you get in the routine. You go home, you're fixing dinner, turn on the TV, you never turn it off. It just becomes a distraction or you grab the, the iPad and you sit down and play games and, and you ignore each other. And, and I just confess, that's a temptation in my life too because I love technology as much as the next person. So I make sure that two or three times a week, my wife and I go to lunch or dinner together alone so we talk. <laughs> it forces the conversation. It's a date night. We're not going to pick up the phones there. That's rude and that it just looks bad, right? So we're going to talk to each other and, and we have those conversations. And it helps all the conversation because we're being intentional about the relationship. If you've got kids at home, please have a night where you unplug and you say, okay, we're going to play games together. We're going to talk together. We're going to discover together. We're going to laugh together. We're going to do something that we enjoy. They're not going to be home that long. And one day you're going to wish you had. And, and by the way, if you build that relationship with your kids now, it'll pay dividends later. Here's what I found. If you start talking to your children when they're, you know, first born, it's not awkward when you try to talk to them as teenagers. But if you don't really have conversation with your kids until they're 13 or 14, they're not going to listen to you anyway. So build those relationships. Bless your kids. If you're single and you're going, none of this stuff applies to me, what am I supposed to do? Then get together with some of your friends that share your faith. And don't just talk about the weather or sports or whatever you normally talk about. Have the God conversation. Hey, what's God teaching you? What are you struggling with? What are you learning? Let's pray for each other. Let's build each other up. They're practical tips, things that will help your life, not fix your life. Are you willing to accept that challenge over the next six weeks? Because God desires to reveal himself to you. Will you be still with him? Will you embrace the gift of the Sabbath? Not a set day but intentional time where you slow down, where you are still, and you know God. Will you be still right now? I know it may be a little bit awkward, but I'm not going to talk. The band's not going to play. Will you just join with me in listening to God? Let's pray.